Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. What is the fate of Kylie Rodney's phone? Has her phone been located? The simple, quick answer to the question is that we don't know. The longer answer is that if the phone wasn't found in the vehicle, you would imagine a search continuing in the area where the vehicle was found after the vehicle was salvaged. Well, did that happen? Consider the possibilities where the vehicle is in water for two weeks, upside down, windows are broken and the vehicle, heavy and filled with water, is subsequently turned right side up, floated to the surface and hauled backwards to shore. In these circumstances, could the phone have fallen out? So I think it's reasonable to assume the phone has been found because it didn't appear as though anyone searched for it afterwards. Also, at 15.53 during the August 22nd press conference, Captain Brown seemed to make an indirect reference to evidence that could be damaged by water that's aside from human tissue. Let's listen in. Describe the difficulty of what water does over two weeks to evidence. It depends. That's a complicated question. I'm not an expert in, in water. However, temperature of the water and things like that come into play. Um, it, but it, it can add difficulty uh, based on many factors that, that can cause damage to obviously things that we want to look at to investigate, but also uh, to, to bodies that may have been submerged for a period of time. In this episode, I want to reimagine the fate of Kylie's phone from three different perspectives. Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do like, share, leave a comment. Many thanks to the hundreds of you who have subscribed. Welcome to the channel. And let's get started. So three perspectives. In this scenario sketch, we'll assume the simplest explanation is true, which is that Kylie was intoxicated, she took a wrong turn, and the poor girl plunged into the reservoir by accident. So the first scenario we're going to look at is the phone is simply in her pocket. Did Kylie have her phone in her jeans pocket or on the seat or the console beside her? Or was she charging it? I think it's unlikely she would have the phone in her pocket as she likely does in this last photo. I do think the moment the vehicle hit the water, the Honda's electronics would fail, causing the headlights to go out as well as the electronics. The dashboard lights would go blank as well. In other words, the first issue Kylie would have been faced with was seeing in the dark. If the vehicle's electronics were knocked out immediately upon hitting the water, the cell phone would have been relatively protected by the driver's capsule. In other words, the cell phone would have been able to provide emergency lighting. So it makes sense that the first thing Kylie would do um, is try to find her phone in the dark. Does that make sense? That brings us to the second perspective. The phone is a lighting tool. Obviously, if Kylie needed a lighting tool and if she was driving with her phone in her hand, then there would be no need to search for the phone in the dark. But I'm guessing she wasn't and that for several crucial seconds, Kylie had to rummage at her feet or under the seats in the dark to find her phone. Remember, with that impact, wherever the phone was, it may have jumped forward um, or jumped to the side slightly. So did she rummage around? Did she find it? If she did, she would have been faced with the next dilemma, how to escape. She would have realized, oh, I see where I am, but how do I escape? And at this point, the Honda would probably still have been floating with a few critical seconds remaining before it filled with water and sank under the water. One option was to use her torch as a hammer and literally smash the window with the hard corner of her phone but that would mean losing the precious light she needed. Another option was to try to bang out the window with her feet or fist or push open the door. But remember, Kylie was a slight 16-year-old. If she did manage to break a window, it probably took a while. As precious seconds passed, she may have considered or attempted to call for help on her phone. In theory, if Sammy or any of the other kids had just left, they could turn around, get back, find her, and help her within a few minutes. And that brings us to the third and final scenario, birdcage. To understand how a traffic accident in water is completely different from one on land, 
So, for example, the one the Uber couple experienced. Imagine carrying a bird in a metal cage, even with a cage door open, and dropping it into water. There would only be a very brief window to get out of the cage before the whole thing sinks underwater, and it would be very difficult to swim downward and get out that way. It would be kind of counterintuitive. In Kylie's case, the impact with the water would be relatively soft, even gentle. That wouldn't be the problem. The impact wouldn't be life-threatening. Blunt force trauma injuries wouldn't be a factor. The problem would be that the protective hull of the vehicle would be locked with the electronics off. Even the windows couldn't open if one pressed the buttons. So as soon as the Honda entered the reservoir, it immediately became a cage filling up with water. Whether right side up or upside down, it's likely the last remaining part of the vehicle to sink would have been the rear, the hatch side. This is because the engine at the front is heavier and gravity and the weight of water drew it down. So the air pocket would move then to the other end where the hatch was and likely Kylie would too. She would follow this air pocket. Even if she succeeded in breaking a window near the front where she was sitting while the vehicle was still above water or even semi-submerged, she would nevertheless probably abandon that point to follow the air pocket. But once the vehicle dropped below the surface and water poured in, she likely tried to get away from the source of the water and stay in the air pocket and then find another place to try and exit the vehicle. This scenario is depicted in the movie The Abyss, except the vehicle is a submersible that begins to leak. I've heard some speculations that if Kylie wasn't found in the driver's seat, this would indicate foul play. But I don't see that at all. I think the opposite is true. If she was found still strapped in, seatbelt fastened, it would indicate foul play. Because any normal person, given that window of time, would move around and try to escape. A vehicle has a protective function in an accident. The metal layers, the columns... The airbags are all meant to protect the driver from physical injury. But in scenarios of water or fire, a vehicle becomes a metal trap. Did you know that Anne Hesch's crash occurred on the same day as the party at the Prosser campground, August 5th? Hesch was driving in broad daylight at 11 a.m. and she was involved in three separate collisions. In the third, rather than driving into a reservoir... 53-year-old Hesch crashed at speed into a house in Mar Vista, causing her vehicle to burst into flames. In that incident, Hesch had to be rescued from the rear because the flames had consumed the front of her vehicle. On paper, and unless you'd seen video footage, you might not believe Hesch could drive into a house or that her driving into a house was voluntary or even an accident. But because we know she was intoxicated and because we have video and photos, it's believable, if shocking, all the same. When Hesh was photographed moments before the incident, it appeared she had her phone in her hand, like many people do while driving. If Kylie's phone could have saved her, it could also have doomed her, especially if she was texting or looking at the bright screen for messages while driving in the pitch dark. So I'm not going to take it further than that. I will be doing a live stream later today dealing with a couple of cases that have come up during the course of August that we've missed. These include Caitlin Armstrong, Alec Baldwin and John Bonet Ramsey. We'll also be looking at why the Artemis 1 uh, mission that was supposed to launch yesterday was scrubbed. A little bit of rocket science on rocket science. So look out for that. I'll put a link to that live stream video in the description. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.